Hey, it's Justin. It's my good friend Joel. And uh, we're here to have some real talk about the summer of 2017 for you, which yeah. uh, I imagine may be the toughest summer you've ever had. So we were working, doing this whole church plant thing, and um, we've been going on for quite a few months or so, and so keeping in touch with my family down here in Illinois, and my uh, my mom just kind of, she called me t- tell him, um, telling us about this Saturday where my dad was working in the yard, and he just started experiencing um, some chest pains and difficulty breathing like he's, mm-hmm. he's never had before. And so I kind of, you know, clued him in that like, maybe this is something I should get, go get checked out. And uh, all of us are kind of Oh, it'll be fine. No big deal. We didn't give it much thought. Um, bad things that happen don't happen to us. They, everybody else gets those stories. <laughs> right. Um, and that's kind of that's how we're feeling when we hear that. And so he goes into the doctor a couple weeks later and they look at it and then, Mr. Strode, this is a bit more serious than just, you know, working too hard. Um, and so long story short was that he, they recommended that he had to go in for a bypass surgery. And uh, so he goes in. And I'm at work, my mom's just texting me and she's just saying, like, hey, he just went in, um, should be out in about, you know, a couple hours. So another few hours go by, uh, doctors come out and they're saying, hey, surgery was uh, successful. The, we're just having trouble bring, like, getting him back, you know, he's putting his heart and lungs on these machines. Um, and uh, eventually get to the point where we can't, we can't take him off these machines. Um, uh, and even more hours go by, and my mom is still not texting us. It's everything from my younger sister who works in the medical field. She kind of knows this stuff, and uh, she's texting my wife and just saying, hey, you guys should probably come home for this. I, th- I think the hardest part in, in this huge transition of moving from bad things don't happen to us to this might be our time mm-hmm. was uh, when <laughs> I had to ask, I had to ask my wife if I should pack a tie. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it was, she's brave enough to say that, yeah, I, I think she should probably bring a tie. Um, we drive um, through the night, we get to the hospital um, early, early, early Saturday morning and just embrace my mom, <laughs> the biggest hug, and uh, see my brothers there and everything. and. Um, so Sunday morning, doctors are kind of, they're saying, hey, if something if something's going to happen, it has to happen today. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, the doctors are, hey, we should probably check to see if there's some brain function going on. It's really, yeah, please go check that, see. Um, and they come back and they're like, there's, there's not a lot happening. They're, he's still alive, he, he's there, um, but he's not the same. And so now it's my sister, my two older brothers, and my mom and myself sitting in a circle, um, now having to decide, like, do we let our dad live as a vegetable or do we have to make a, make a decision? And as we're in that circle praying and talking about it, trying to figure out what my dad would want, uh, my dad decides that, that he's gonna make the decision. <laughs> and, uh, and so in that discussion, he passes away right there. Mm. And, uh, and that was it. Friday, Friday. Friday to Sunday. Friday to Sunday. Uh, what did it feel like in the hours after, after Dad went to heaven? Um, none of it feels real. You're, you're incredibly numb to everything. Uh, and it, the farther away from that weekend I get, uh, just as far as time, uh, the more I realize how numb we were to everything. Because two weeks later, I won't get into it, but two weeks later, the job I was working in Minnesota was no more. We shut our doors as a church. We were no more, we were no longer a church. We just couldn't survive. And so, in, in the span of, you know, two, two and a half weeks, I lose my dad and my job. Mm-hmm. And this thing that I felt God was calling me to. And so, uh, you feel like you don't even feel like yourself anymore. You, you're totally foreign to any of this. And you're, 
You, you, you almost even feel like you're foreign to your own body. Mm. Um, in these moments when I'm thinking about my dad or when I'm missing him, um, it's a lot of just cluelessness. Wow. Yeah. You know, when it comes to loss and grief, there's a lot of us who would say, I haven't really experienced what I've heard, the kind of uh, confusion and, and the, the feelings of heaviness and possibly, possibly even guilt that people have felt. But it's also quite possible that when you hear Joel's story, you immediately say, I have been there. I have felt that, even if his grief story isn't yours. Joel abruptly lost his father in a, in a chapter of his calling. And I want you to know there's a fuller version of that testimony that, that we want you to see and hear. Uh, just go to our website and you'll be able to, to find that. Think of all the people that I know that have grieved deeply, people who have lost spouses and people who have lost parents, people who have lost pregnancies, lost small businesses, lost reputations, lost health or, or just vital functional abilities. The greater the loss, the deeper the grief. And it's for these reasons, it's why we want to talk about this today is because while we're in mourning, we can be faced with this really bleak outlook on the future. Uh, we can uh, be ushered right into despair and depression and find ourselves overwhelmed with this thing called hopelessness. And we're in a series called Hope is Alive. We have come to this, this discussion. Our heart has been to know the ways in which the hope that God gives is always available, even when it appears like it's nowhere to be found. Hope is alive because God is a mighty God. He's a conquering king. He's a warrior. He always beats death with life. And he's a refuge and a rescuer for his people. I just don't feel any of that when I am submerged in, in, in grief. And so here's how we're going to talk about hope in grief and loss today. We're gonna answer this, this one question. If you're taking notes, this is what goes on the top of the page. We're gonna address this question. What is God doing when I am lost in loss? What is God doing when I am lost in loss? Because you see, our biggest hangup in a season of grief is, is it feels like everything important has come to a halt in our lives. Like the good things have stopped. We, we, we remain fixated on this thing that we miss, that we just don't think we'll ever get back. We're reminded every day that we still don't yet feel whole. And before we get into our passage, I want to illustrate this with a pretty well-known verse from the Old Testament. And uh, I, I want to use this verse also because you might learn some things about this. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. Might be a favorite for you. Here's the verse. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil. They are plans to give you a future and a hope. We love to love that verse. That's like a great yay God, yay me kind of verse. Let's put it on a coffee mug. And what you may not know is that those words were spoken to people who felt like everything good, everything good had come to a halt. You see, they had been invaded by an evil empire. It was the Babylonian empire and all of their their, uh, their city was leveled. Their monuments were leveled. They, these people were ripped from their homes and their livelihoods. Men, women, and children were slain in cold bloods. And the survivors were all deported and made slaves in Babylon. And in this new life of slavery, suffering tremendous loss, reminded of it every day. If they're anything like us, they're gonna be struggling with that, this idea that there really is a God. And if there is a God, is he really in control? And if he is in control, does he really have my best interests in mind? It's to those people that God spoke these words. I know the plans I have for you and they are plans for good, not for evil. 
plans to give you a future and a hope. You see, in the aftermath of everything that had stopped, God wanted to show them what he was still doing. And it's the same for us. In my grief, if God will tell me what he is doing, then I can start to sense some hope in my hopeless situation. So what is God doing when I'm lost in loss? So we're gonna unpack that answer from a portion of the Bible called 2 Corinthians, or in your Bible, it might be called the second letter to the Corinthians. It's in, late in the New Testament. Uh, please find that in your Bible, if you would. It's in this letter that it becomes very clear that the writer, whose name, uh, who we call the Apostle Paul, this guy knows loss. You go to chapter one, you start at verse eight. He says this, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble that we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. See, Paul paints a real glamorous picture of what life is like as a traveling evangelist slash church planter slash missionary. I give you the spark notes on the whole letter second letter to the Corinthians. He talks about how he was shipwrecked, shipwrecked multiple times. He was publicly beaten. He was unfairly prisoned, imprisoned. He was nearly torn apart in a riot here. He was almost executed in a civil case there. This guy was worked to the bone. He endured sleepless nights. He had gone without food. See, Paul had lost all conventional sense of health and, and safety. And you can find that in chapters two and four and six and 11 if you wanna see that in detail. He's lost all that. In this letter, he also, he openly mourns the loss of trust and respect of these Corinthians that he had spiritually raised and fathered. It was, a, it was an undeserved relational shutout. I know that many of you have had that hurt. It was a true loss for him. Plus there was a, this other loss of, just a sense of security that he used to enjoy. He, he used to have the status of a well-respected Pharisee, but now all those religious leaders saw him as a defector and a traitor. Paul had to grow eyes in the back of his head. There's lots of loss here. Look at verse nine. He says, in fact, we expected to die. And I know you've said those words. If you have grieved anything deeply, you have said, look, I, I cannot see next week from here. It, it's curtains for me. It's over. I, I, I can't see into tomorrow from underneath this pile. Well, Paul knows pain and God's word in his life is going to coach us in ours because many things may have stopped in your life, but the redemptive work of an almighty God is not one of them. What is God doing when I'm lost in loss? I'm going to give you three facts. He's all straight from God's word. Fact number one, in loss, God is inviting you to come close. In loss, God is inviting you to come close. Chapter one, verse three. Paul writes at the very top of this letter, all praise to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in our troubles. Let me ask you, how have you found yourself addressing God lately? Whatever you call him is likely a descriptor of how God is meeting you in whatever you're going through in this stage of your life. Well, what did we already learn about Paul? Paul knows pain and he has discovered afresh that God, he's a merciful father and he is the source of all comfort. He would be calling God these things. He wouldn't be starting his letter off this way if he didn't have the joy of knowing him this way through the suffering that he was enduring in his life. See, in loss, God is inviting us to come close. And I realize that God is always available for us to come close, but it's typically only in our pain that we go looking for him, right? It was C.S. Lewis that said these famous words, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. See, God's special invitation to your heart upon the death of something is to come and drink from the spring of eternal life. He's a merciful father, which means that he will accept you 
even when your pain causes you to behave clumsy. He's the source of all comfort. You know what that means? It means that this is where you find the good stuff, the comfort that brings actual, true healing. This is what I have learned from experience. Maybe you've learned this as well, is that not all human comfort is good comfort. Because there are well-intended, well-intended uh, intentioned people in our lives who will try to comfort us by, by throwing out easy platitudes and, and, and sayings and even scripture that, that really more functions like go away money than it is about a, a, an intentional message to our heart in a specific time. There are other people who have tried to comfort me by getting mad for me or being disgusted with me. And I have found that's not helpful. It's just making me more disgusted and more mad. That's actually only going to cause more pain down the road if that's the comfort that I get through this season on. But God is the source of all comfort. He's the one with the good stuff, the comfort that leads to true health and leads to life. See, what we can learn is that closeness to God is what we need in a time of grief. And that's what God is inviting in loss. Closeness to God is what we need in a time of grief. I'm reminded of the, of the power of closeness as any parent is. If you're a parent of littles like I am, you're reminded of this uh, two, three times a day when they come hobbling towards you. They've had a really hard fall or a, just a serious scrape or some skull collision and they come crying to you. And what do you do? You get down on their level. You let them see the concern in your face. You make the eye contact and you just pull them in just real close. I gotta tell you, this is sort of a new thing. This is an epiphany for me as a father, but I am learning that that closeness is key. It's healing. And it's not because it's medical. It's because it's emotional. That's the space. And I'm talking about 20 seconds, maybe 60 seconds. In that closeness, that's where your kid starts to slow down, stop hyperventilating, start to get their wits about them a little bit. There's, a, there's an unnamed fear inside them that starts to subside. It's the fear that worse things are gonna happen. But they don't believe that anymore because I'm here now. They, because they're, they're with their dad. They sense the closeness. They start to talk it out a little bit. Here's the thing, is that when closeness starts doing its thing in your pain, you are already well on your way to recovery. And then we can start talking through how to sew this finger back on or whatever the case is. Closeness to God is what we need in a time of grief. God is inviting that in your loss. Now, I realize there's lots of other parents out there. and Your kids aren't seven anymore, and you've learned how to approach closeness in a completely different way. You, you remember the days when uh, you would just call out, who wants to go with dad in the car? And your littles would be like, me! And they'd just start running for the car. They have no idea where you're going. You could be going to the garbage dump. You could be going to take them for shots. They have no idea. They don't care. They just want to go and be close to you. But once your kids are 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, who wants to go with dad in the car? You know, that response sounds like this. Tell me where you're going first. No, nah, I don't want to go there. And closeness is accomplished in a completely different manner in those days. It usually sounds like when your 16 to 21 year old says, um, I, uh, I guess I got to go to this place called a DMV or I, I have to go to a, a recruiter's office or I have to do something for like jury duty. And I got to tell you, I've never been there before. I'm a little nervous about it. I, I don't really feel like I know what I'm doing. That's when as a father, you can say, well, hey, tell you what, I've been there before. I'll go with you. And suddenly now we have closeness. Now I'll tell you what, none of us want to go through suffering. None of us do. We, we don't want to endure suffering. But if you're going to do it, you may as well take Jesus with you, especially because he has been there before. Hebrews 4 tells us that Jesus, the Son of God, understands our weaknesses, for he, is, he, he faced all the same testings that we do. And yet he didn't sin. He didn't cave. The prophet Isaiah called this about Jesus hundreds of years before Jesus walked the face of the earth when he said in uh, Isaiah 53 that our Savior would be a man of sorrows acquainted with the deepest grief. In loss, God offers to come close and be our source of all comfort and a merciful understanding guide through the darkest valley that you've ever been through. And that's a fact. Fact number two, 
in loss, God is revealing that the good life is always in his grace. Let me say that again. In loss, God is revealing that the good life is always in his grace. Now, I say it that way because you and I know that there's really, if you've grieved, you know there's really no such thing as a full recovery from a deep loss. Anybody who has endured can tell you Feelings of sadness just can return to you in waves. They can overtake you by surprise at any time. It can be triggered by a, a variety of things like holidays, anniversaries, certain locations, certain memories, objects, even certain smells. And bam, you are right back to missing the thing that you lost. And that lost in the deeper the grief, the more you and I find ourselves longing for this thing we call the good old days. We want the good old days back. We wanna be in that pre-loss season where we just felt better. We had that thing that we just missed so terribly and we missed the days that we just didn't limp through life so badly. But it feels like today that we depend on grace way more just to get by. Well, let me tell you something. In life, excuse me, in loss, God is revealing that the good life is always in his grace. Let me show you what Paul says about his ministry team. It's in chapter one, verse 12. He says, we have depended on God's grace, not on our own human wisdom. As a team, they had no misgivings about their abilities to get along through a tough appointment. And dare I say, you might be in a tough appointment right now. Here's what they say. They say, hey, our intuitions are savvy, not gonna cut it. We depend on, on, on God's grace. And completing the thought a few lines later, verse 21, he says this, it's God who enables us along with you to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us. He has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts is the first installment that guarantees everything he's promised us. Now look at those verses. How do we stand firm? Well, we don't stand firm on explanations. We stand firm on promises. You and I will never receive a satisfying answer to the why God, why now, why me questions in life. We never will but it's by the power of his grace that we will be able to stand firm anyway. See, the good old days, they're not just behind you, they're ahead of you because you still have God's grace. And the good life is always in his grace. Paul goes on later in his letter in chapter 12 to share about a deep, very personal struggle and by verse eight, he's saying three different times, I begged the Lord to just, Take it away. You've prayed this prayer before, haven't you? You've had enough of the struggle and you've wondered, why doesn't God just put things back the way they were? And verse nine has God's response to that prayer and it's become somewhat of a life verse for me. He said in verse nine, each time God said to me that my grace is all that you need and my power, it works best in weakness. So you and I have God's word that you are better off with his grace for the struggle than you are with zero struggle and zero grace. Have his word. What he says is my grace is all that you need. And he says, your weakness is gonna be a fantastic stage for showcasing my power in your life. You know what I love to do? I love to spend money, especially when it's somebody else's. And I'm sure I'm not alone in saying we remember the good old college days when we were just broke as a joke. We were old enough to have our own debit card, but we were young enough to have basically nothing in that account. That's the card we carried with us everywhere we went. And for whatever rare purpose or whatever specific reason, there was that time you also had dad's debit card in your wallet as well, some special errand or whatever, and you've got both in there. And, and when the normal routine of life would have had you reaching for your debit card, it occurred to you that father's debit card was at your fingertips. 
And that's a, diff- that's a completely different ball game, isn't it? And it occurred to you how much your father would have really wanted you to have those new Air Jordan 13 flints, you know, in the shop next door to the Payless that you were about to, to walk into. See, the question in our pain is this. Whose account do you want to live off of? Whose resource, resources do you want to live off of? Yours or dad's? See, your pain is God's opportunity to call you back to living in the riches of his grace. That's where the good life is. That's what Paul was experiencing. And that's why when he talks about his intense personal struggle and about how God said, my grace is all you need and my power works best in your weakness, that's why he starts to sound a little like a nut job by verse nine and verse 10. He says, so now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure. I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, the hardships, the persecutions, the troubles that I suffer for Christ. What's the laundry list there? Anything that reminds me to go back to living on dad's account, that'll work. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. And I know this can be a mind bender for us, to change to the way that we've always thought. But listen, while you work through the difficulties and the drawbacks of this struggle, be prepared for God to also show you the opportunities in this struggle. He wants to show you that his grace, that's where the good life is. What is God doing when I'm lost in loss? Finally, third fact, in loss, God is expanding your purpose in life. In loss, God is expanding your purpose in life. You want to talk about unique opportunities. Listen to what Paul says. Chapter one, verse four, he says, God comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. And if you're working through a loss, I get it. You suddenly feel like you've become a member of a club that you never really asked to join. It's, It's the widowed club. It's the... It's the lost my business club. It's the house fire club. It's the, it could be even the COVID-19 club. And I realized that that club membership is marked by a loss and that's depressing for you. And what I wanna challenge you to remember is that this God who takes away, he's also the God that gives. He's always giving. He's gonna give you all that you need and more. He's the source of all comfort. He's gonna give you all kinds of grace and power to keep moving And you're going to experience a new level of calling on your life. He's going to open up the field of life change opportunity for you. He's going to drive you to a new sector of society, people that you didn't previously have the qualifications to serve in a special way before. True story from my own life just this past week. It just so happens I have randomly had two long meetings uh, with two friends in the last week, virtually, One, several states to the east. The other one, several states to the west. Common denominator. Both of them have recently been burned badly in full-time ministry. And they're trying to figure out which which way is up. They're trying to assess the wound. And I just, I personally just feel so driven to listen to their story and help them unpack it and support in any way that I can. Is it because I'm a good guy? No, not necessarily. It's because in my experience in ministry, I've been downsized. I've been abruptly fired. I've been mysteriously position eliminated uh, by surprise. And I've been straight up forced out. So take your pick. And what does that make me? It might make me Jonah. Some of you might (laughs) need to throw me over the side of some ship. But I'll tell you what it makes me. It makes me equipped The harm and the loss that I have lived through is how God has equipped me to turn the comfort that he has given to me to be a comfort that he is giving through me. In loss, God is expanding your purpose in life as well. Your scar story is gonna be your access card and the power that God is going to display through your life is going to manifest itself in ways that just looks like superpowers to the rest of us humans. God is going to give you a special sensitivity 
to people who are hurting in the ways that you used to hurt. He's gonna give you the capacity to, to recognize and empathize with, with wounds that the average person simply cannot. He's going to make work for you, this proven skill you have to survive in the tension between the hope and the pain in the very place where other people just throw in the towel, throw in the towel, throw in the towel. God's gonna do that through you because the God who found you when you weren't looking for him, and you thought your life was fine, that's the God who is still leading you and me to places that we never thought we needed or wanted to go. And you might need these words a month from now or a year from now, or you might need them right now. And this is what I wanna assure you. I wanna assure you that God is not allowing things to snuff out your light. Let me, let, me, let me quote Paul. This is 2 Corinthians 4. He says, no, no, no. The God who said, let there be light in the darkness has made this light to shine in our hearts so that we could see the glory of God. And other people who are watching us, they see, all they see is a person who is pressed from all sides, but he is never crushed. He's, he's perplexed, but he is not driven to despair. Why? Because he's making it clear that a human is fragile like a clay jar. But this, this is superhuman. There's a power in this life that is not from us. It's a power that, come, that can only come from God. And these unstoppable purposes that are at work in your life, he says by verses 15 and 16, they are going to result in, in God's grace reaching more and more people and God receiving more and more glory. So listen, this is not where you tap out. This is where you level up. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. He's, he's un, unfolding this thing. The, 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 these things are still happening. He is at work. He's, he's inviting you to come closer than ever. He's revealing that the good life is still there for you because it's always in his grace. He's expanding the purpose in your life. These are plans for good, not for evil. They are plans to give you a future and a hope. And in 2 Corinthians 4, by the time he gets to verse 16, he says this line that I, I kind of want to help us end on. He says these words. Therefore, we do not lose heart. And I want to be at least one person who will tell you today, you don't have to lose your heart over this. Though outwardly we are wasting away, like the pain continues to cut us deeply in ways that other people just can't see. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, at least that's what they are by comparison, they are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And so we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen since what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal may we fix our eyes on the source of all comfort on the giver of all grace in the deepest moments of our pain so that he can continue to work his eternal good in and through our lives and carry us through these seasons of loss. They will become seasons of victory.
Praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is a merciful Father. He's the source of all comfort, and He comforts us in our trouble. And we pray as a family, dear God, under a thousand roofs right now, but drawn together by the power of Your Spirit. And we pray for those of us under heavy burden. Those of us who the seasons of loss feel so long ago and they're still sticking with us. To the young couple who lost their child at 30 weeks. For those who lost a parent and held their hand through a long season and it just didn't feel long enough. To my sweet friend who lost a nephew at such a young age and just has not gotten over it yet. For my friend who lost his shirt in, a bu- in, his, in his business startup through no fault of his own. Father, you know our hearts. We are looking for hope. And we know that we can find it in you. We know that there's nowhere else to go for the words of life but you. And so we're coming to you together for ourselves, for the people that we know. Your hope is the anchor for our souls. And we pray the same thing for each of us, that you'd send your comfort, that you'd give your grace, that you would show your power and lead us in the light of your love. 
because you always conquer death with more and more life and nothing is gonna separate us from your love. And so we know that in you, we've got all that we need. We have all that we need. So we praise you, knowing that the rest of the story is coming, that eternity is ahead and that your great purposes are being worked out. What an honor to see them worked out in our fragile lives. And we pray these things unto the unstoppable King Jesus. Amen.